there was a time here in this nation, particularly in this part of the country, where many times business arrangements were just simply made as a verbal agreement. You know, yes, I'll do this or I'll do that. And they shook hands, and that was it. That, that was all there was. That was the only contract that was needed. They simply talked it over and said, well, yes, I'll do this, you do that, you shook hands, and it was sent. And I think we realize that's not generally the way business is conducted today. There would be a lot of lawyers and a lot of courts that would be out of business if it were. One of the most thriving, growing uh, growth industries uh, is, of course, in the legal profession. And the whole civil court do uh, doctrine is primarily composed of individuals who are trying to go back on their word. You know, if you eliminate from the civil court docket in this nation every case that involves a person who is trying to go back on his word, you pretty well eliminate things. I, I don't know. Maybe there would be one or two left, but I think those would be few and far between. Because you see that this involves, uh, this involves everything. It involves divorce. Now, at one time, they gave their word. They said, I do. Now, they've come to a point where they said, well, I don't really. People made an agreement. They signed a contract. Well, you know, you pay me so much, and I'll go in, and I'll, uh, and I'll, uh, uh, you know, do this work on your house, or I'll buy this, and you, you, uh, you know, give me so much. And they make this agreement. And then somewhere along the line, they decide, well, you know, I don't really want to do that. I, I don't think that's a very good deal. I don't think I'm going to follow through with that. There was an interesting article in the Houston Post uh, just a couple of days ago. I don't know how many of you saw it. Uh, it, it just, it, it was tragic, really, and it, and it focused in on the type of things that go on in our society. It gave the story of a man here in Houston. In fact, he's actually employed by a government agency, uh, an agency that has as its job to make loans to low-income people to help them fix up their homes. It's a government-subsidized loan program. This particular man worked for this program, but he was also in a category where he needed some help. And so he applied for a loan uh, under the terms of this program. It took him three months to process his loan. Uh, you know, all the paperwork and everything. And he was mentioning in there, he says, you know, I'm better equipped to handle this stuff than most, most people because I, I work for them. I know how it goes. Knowing the ropes took him three months to get it through. And so they signed a contract, this guy was going to come in, boy, he was going to fix the house up, and they had uh, stipulated in the contract, there was a date, I think it was December 14th, that he was supposed to be completed, have all the work completed. Well, here it is, of course, the end of May, and you guessed it, the work is not nearly completed. In fact, it had a picture of this guy sitting there in his house, and it was all uh, torn to shambles. Uh, this contractor had come in, torn out the plumbing, done a few other odds and ends, and, and then just simply quit. He'd gotten what money he thought he could get out of it, and uh, somewhere along the line, he changed his mind, and he decided that he wasn't really going to follow through. Uh, he, uh, his word didn't mean anything. His signature on a piece of paper didn't mean anything. Well, here this thing has been haggling on. Instead of December 14th, you know, January, February, March, April, May, all have come and gone. And the job still isn't finished. Contract doesn't mean anything. Word doesn't mean anything. Obligation doesn't mean anything. You know, lawyers, uh, the legal profession has, has multiplied many times over in size. The civil court dockets have been absolutely cram-packed full. New courts have been created. Their dockets have gotten full also. All over people trying to go back on their word, trying to change that which they have uttered. People make a uh, an agreement today. They find it inconvenient a little bit later to keep that agreement. And then they decide, well, you know, I just won't do it. There ought to be some way I can get out of that. Maybe I'll get me a good lawyer. Boy, I'll, I'll fix him up. Lawsuits are primarily based on people trying to get out. Someone, somewhere, trying to get out of what he's obligated to do. You know, if, people, if, if everybody was... was really intent, their whole heart was into fulfilling their obligation, being honest, then you would settle the need for a lot of those things. Many times we're quick, we're quick to agree to something. A little while later we find there's a problem. 
You know, brethren, this, 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 this affects us. Many of us have been affected by some of the attitudes and some of the, the whole concept that just permeates our society. We can put a list on the bulletin board and we can say, you know, we really need people to sign up. We, we've got some widow's yards that need mowing and we really need some help on it. We need some people to sign up the list. Oh, you know, we can go back, we, we, we can go back there and we get a list. We've got a list full of people, all taken care of. Well, then maybe comes the Sunday where somebody's yard was supposed to be mowed and nobody shows up. Why is that? Well, well, I don't know. I, I, you know, I was up kind of late last night, and I figured somebody else would be out there. I didn't figure they needed me. We'll agree to things. We'll give our word. We'll say, oh, yeah, you know, I'll do it. But then somewhere along the line, something comes up. We, we find something else we'd rather do. And we just kind of lose in the shuffle the fact that we said we would do something. And it goes by the board. Well, I, I want us to look into a little bit today, what God has to say about the value of our spoken word. God God has quite a bit to say in the Bible about what you say. Now, notice back in the book of John. Let's go back here and see what Jesus Christ said. John chapter 8. We find a lot of lying in the land. We find a lot of misrepresentation, a lot of deception. John chapter 8. Jesus Christ told the people in verse 32, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, Oh, we're Abraham, see. We were never in bondage to any man. How do you say you shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Truly I say unto you, Whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. The servant abides not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. The Son, therefore, shall make you free. You shall be free indeed. I know that you're Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father. And you do that which you have seen with your father. Now, here Christ seems to be innovating something. He seems to indicate that those people that were listening to him had a different father than he did. He said, I speak the things I've heard of my father, you speak the things you have of your father. They said, well, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the work of Abraham. If you were spiritually the children of Abraham, you would be acting like Abraham acted. But now you seek to kill me. Abraham didn't do something like that, because I'm telling you the truth. You do the deeds of your father. He said unto him, We be not born of fornication, we have one father, even God. And Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceed forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he said, Why do you not understand my speech? Because you, you can't, you know, you don't really hear, you don't really discern what I'm saying. You are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him, when he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. We're told here that Satan the devil is the inventor of lies. Satan the devil invented lies. He is called a liar and the father of a lie. We're told that Satan the devil would not abide in the truth. He did not abide in the truth. He did not continue to dwell in the truth. All right? Now, this is very apparent. You go back to Genesis chapter 3. And when sin is introduced in the Bible, the very first sin that is mentioned in the account in Genesis, the very first sin that is mentioned is why? See, in Genesis 3, 1, we read, Now the serpent was more subtle than any other beast of the field which the eternal God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, as God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said, Oh, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. Oh, no, you won't die. Did God tell you that? 
You can't really believe what God said. We have the story, Satan the devil introduced lie. He is a liar from the, he is a liar, the father of a lie. And so we have a society that is based in that way. We find even our own nature described. Notice back in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 5. Thus says the Eternal, Cursed be the man that trusts in man, makes flesh his arm, and whose heart depart from the Eternal. Cursed be the man that trusts in man, and makes flesh his arm. If you're going to trust in man, you're going to put your trust in human beings. You're going to rely on people. God says you're you're in trouble. You're really in trouble if you're going to put your faith and your confidence and your trust in human beings. Because you see, human beings don't generally prove uh, very faithful, very reliable. Now, God tells us on over just a couple of verses in verse 7, Blessed is the man that trusts in the eternal and whose hope the eternal is. You put your faith, you put your trust in some human e- instrument, in, in, in a human being, and, uh, you know, an arm of flesh, your heart departs from God, you're going to rely on people, and you're going to run into trouble. You can't always depend on people to do what they say they're going to do, but you can put your trust in God. Now, it comes on down, and it tells us a little bit of why that's the case in verse 9. The heart is deceitful. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the eternal, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his way, and according to the fruit of his doing. Now, God says that we hit ourselves. God describes here our human nature, and says that one of the primary attributes, one of the primary characteristics of our human nature is that we kid ourselves. We kid ourselves about ourselves. The heart is deceitful above all things. We kid ourselves about what some of our motives are. We kid ourselves about what we're doing and why we're doing it. Sometimes we can't even be honest with ourselves, much less with someone else. We make excuses for ourselves. We justify ourselves. In other words, we are not honest with ourselves. We're never going to recover from any problem until we face up, honestly, to the problem and to our part in it. The heart is deceit. Desperately wicked. Who can know it? God can know it. And we can know it with God's help. There's where the key is. You know, lying, of course, is the basis of deceit. We're told that back in Revelation 12, Satan the devil is described, that great dragon, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. So he's a liar, he's the father of a lie, he deceives the world. Now when people are deceived, lying comes in somewhere, somewhere, somewhere along the line, somebody's lying. When there is deceit involved. Now, we can, as I say, we can kid ourselves. And sometimes our motive in what we say, we, we can wind up just taking things lightly. It doesn't necessarily mean that, our, that we've sat down and premeditated some, some evil motive. Notice back in Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21, verse 28. Here Christ is speaking to some people. He says, what do you think? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, Son, uh, go work in my, go work today in my vineyard. The son answered and said, "Uh, No, I'm not going. But after he repented and went. And he came to the second son. He said, Son, he said, Likewise, said, Son, 
I need you to go out and work in the vineyard today. Second son said, uh, Yes, sir. Yes, sir, dad boy. I'll, I'll go, I'll do it. I go, sir. And he went, no. Which one of the two did the will of his father? And they said, well, the first. Jesus said unto them, truly, I say unto you, the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Now, here we find, we find an account. Now, it doesn't say that this second son willfully sat down and thought out ahead of time, you know, I'm not going to pull, I'm not, I'm going to tell dad a lie. Maybe he intended to go when he said, you know, when his dad came and said, look, I need you to go work in the vineyard today. Maybe his intentions were good. It doesn't say that they weren't. It simply says he didn't go. And he did not take his obligation seriously. He said yes. But between the time he said yes and the time he was to be in the vineyard, he got sidetracked. Maybe some of his friends came along and said, hey, come on, let's, let's, let's go into town. We got this deal going. Come on, come on with us. Well, I don't know. I'm supposed to go work in the vineyard. Oh, you can do that later. Come on, you don't need to worry about that. Come on with us. Well, I guess so. Maybe that transpired. Maybe, maybe something else. We're not told exactly what happened. The point is, he didn't go. He said, yes. Yeah. Put his name on the sign-up list. Oh, yeah, boy, you can count on me, Dad. We have that. We put out lists for things. We fill it up. Boy, everybody's ready to obligate themselves. We can, you know, consider that we're going to have a pretty considerable attrition rate. Because that's not the way it works. We have those that say, I go. They don't go. Then we have those that don't, I, that don't say, I'm going. And then a little later, they get to thinking about that, and they repent of that. And they decide, well, no, you know, that's not really right. Uh, you know, I was asked to go. There's, there's a need. There's, there's something that I ought to be doing. And so I'm just going to go, and I'm going to do it. Christ used that example. He used it here with, with the Pharisees. He said, you know, the publicans and the harlots are going to enter into the kingdom before you. You profess that you obey God. You profess to be the people of God. And you're not doing what God told you to do. They don't profess to be. But they're going to, you know, they're going to change their tune. They're going to repent. They're going to go in before you do. Because your attitude is wrong. Well, there's a lesson here. There's a lesson even in terms of our own of our own obligations, of the way that we ought to look at and think about our words. Because we have too many things that, that come up. Too many times things things transpire. Difficulties come up, misunderstandings come up, problems arise. Simply because we do not take seriously our obligation to do what we say we will do. God has many Laws that deal very direct with the subject of falsehood. Of course, treated very directly in Exodus chapter 20, verse 16, one of the Ten Commandments, says very simply, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You're not to bear false witness. Now that's amplified, restated in a little bit different fashion, a little further over in the law, in Leviticus 19. Uh, Leviticus 19 and verse 11 says, You shall not steal, neither deal falsely, neither lie one to another. Well, this amplifies it a little bit. You don't deal falsely. You don't lie one to another. You shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shall you profane the name of your God, I am the eternal. You shall not defraud your neighbor. So God expands out this law of not bearing false witness bear false witness uh, through deceit. We are kind of skimming the corners in, in, in what we do, what we say. Defraud our neighbor, taking advantage of someone. Notice over in Deuteronomy 19, brings out a little bit more. I'll tell you what, if, if God's law concerning perjury were applied in this nation, I think we would cut down on some of the problems. God had a very stringent law concerning perjury. Mentioned back in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 16. If a false witness rise up against any man, 
to testify against him that which is wrong. Then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the eternal, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those men. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition, and behold, if the witness be a false witness and is testified falsely against his brother, then shall you do unto him as he has thought to have done unto his brother. So shall you put away evil from among you. And those which remain shall hear and fear, and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among them. John says, look, you know the way to wipe out the problem? Somebody comes and they tell a lie. They bear false witness. They perjure themselves. They're going to get somebody in trouble. You find out that that's the case, and the individual who perjured himself is to be punished with the same punishment that the person against whom he testified would have received had he been found guilty. Well, that's pretty strong, because you go down and perjure yourself in a murder trial, and you can get hung. You see? It just depends on, on what the crime is. You get the punishment the other fellow would have got. You're convicted perjury. Pretty strong law. Kind of serve as a little bit of a deterrent. See, God, God looks upon it very, as a very major thing. Very serious matter. Let's go on back to the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 4. Let's notice what God has to say about this whole nation. Hosea chapter 4, verse 1. Hear the word of the eternal, you children of Israel, for the eternal has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. God has a controversy. With this nation, why? Because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying, and killing and stealing, and committing adultery, they break out and blood touches blood, therefore shall the land mourn. God says he has a controversy with the land, with the inhabitants of the land, because there's no truth. We talk about truth and advertising in our nation. We don't have truth in advertising. They make them print on the cigarette pack. You know, the Surgeon General has determined that smoking is hazardous to your health. It cause cancer. It's supposed to be truth in advertising. You drive down the road, when you see a big billboard up advertising cigarettes, what do they have? You got a picture of this guy laying there in his bed, ravaged by cancer, right? And he just, you know, you can just look at him and you can see the effects of all of the cancer and the chemotherapy and all the things they've done to him. And the guy, maybe he has a tube in that he's breathing with. And he, you know, the picture's made uh, maybe uh, just an hour or so. Uh, he's, he's just, uh, you know, right at the point of death. And it, it points this out and it says, you know, uh, smoke our brand, you know, the real thing. This is what it will do for you. No, they don't advertise that way. They've got this real, you know, virile-looking character, just the epitome of good health, a man or a woman, you know, they're out, maybe they're riding a horse or they're doing this or that, and they look just absolutely filled with health and strength and vitality, feel so good. And they've got, you know, the cigarette they're smoking, and they've got a, a pack there, and if you had a micro, if you had a magnifying glass, and you examine real closely, you might find in little tiny letters uh, somewhere down, you know, in the corner of, of the ad, uh, this, uh, you know, the Surgeon General has determined smoking can be hazardous to your health. And we call this truth in advertising. No, if we were telling the truth in advertising, we'd show the picture of the guy, you know, dying of cancer. And say, you know, smoke our brand. It's the real thing. It'll really do it to you. I mean, for you. Uh, we, we talk about truth in advertising. You know, they, they can advertise, uh, they can advertise, um, uh, uh, a processed meat as being pure beef. Uh, and have up to 30%, this is FDA regulations, they can have up to 30% chicken in it. And call it pure beef. That's truth in advertising. Now, if it's got 31%, they can't call it pure beef. I mean, you know, it's incredible some of the things you, you read, some of the regulations. Uh, you, you would think, you know, you would think, well, you know what pure beef is or pure anything. I mean, pure is pure, right? Wrong. You ought to read what the, how the FDA defines pure. And it goes through and tells you how much impure you can have in and still call it pure. You know, we're, we're based on lying, on deceit. 
They don't want to get up front. They don't want to tell you what something's going to cost. Well, you know, you hear the car, hear the, hear the ad. You know, just put, uh, uh, you know, my, uh, you know, come buy our product. Well, we got this great deal for you. Put down nine ninety nine, pay nine ninety nine a month for ninety nine months, and you know, uh, we, we got this great deal for you. Total cost thirty five dollars or whatever it is. Uh, you add it up, boy, it doesn't add up. Well, God says there's no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. We're not a nation that 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 is based on truth. Of course, our government would never lie to us, would? They? And we know we can depend on the news media to tell us the truth. Uh, they're they're really active. They they they've had all kinds of good things. Congress, legislature. I, I thought there was a very interesting article. You know, we're Texas is in the midst of redistricting, and uh, uh, Lynn Ashby had a very interesting article in paper a couple of days ago, and he he talked about they were redrawing the lines. He said the last line uh, that has been drawn in Texas uh, that uh, uh, you know was based on any kind of, of uh, Noble concept was the line that Travis drew in the dirt uh, at the, the Alamo, because the legislature was carving things up, and they had some of these districts that looked like a salamander. They stretched and sprawled and squiggled all across the map. Everybody trying to protect himself. Well, that's you know kind of the way it is. John says by swearing and lying. He puts the two right hand and hand together, and that's the way it is. People swear on one side and lie on the other. They go down and they obligate themselves to all kinds of things. This is what lawsuits are based on. Whether you're talking about uh, all kind, all kinds of suits, swearing and lying. People sign a contract. People promise and covenant uh, before God in regards to marriage. People uh, sign, you know, on the dotted line. Boy, they swear this, that, and the other. Usually the guy that's uh, swearing the loudest and the longest and on the biggest stack, he's the one that you better be most careful of. No, that's why God says, look, just let your yay be yay and your nay nay. You don't need to bring in all these other things, uh, swearing on your great-grandmother's uh, tomb and, and uh, uh, all this kind of stuff. That, that's ridiculous. I mean, you're either telling the truth or you're not. You're either a man of your word or you're not. God says, let your yea be yea and your nay, nay. Mean what you say. I mean, for, for a guy who, for a guy who is a liar, to really promise you that he's telling the truth this time, just doesn't mean that much. I mean, if you've got to really assure somebody, look, I really mean it this time. It's really true. You can really count on it. Well, you know, if, if you've got to convince me you're really telling the truth this time, because, you know, that's not your normal practice, or why should I believe that you, just because you add in a few reallys and a few other things, uh, that you're, you know, really doing anything? By swearing and lying, killing and stealing, committing adultery, they break out, blood touches blood. One thing just leads to another, like the length of a chain. Therefore shall the land mourn, and every one that dwells therein shall languish, and the beasts of the field, the fowls of heaven, yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. Coming on down, verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because they have rejected knowledge. I will also reject you. Coming on down. Verse 7, as they were in Crete, so they sinned against me. The more our nation has prospered and been blessed, the more material-minded we have become, the less appreciative to God, the less ethical in our, the less ethical in our conduct, the less our word means. We've seen that. We've seen a trend in this nation, even in just the last few years, the last two or three decades. Tremendous upsurge in all types of civil lawsuits, which are based on swearing and lying. Swear today and, you know, people swear that they're going to do this, that, and the other, and actually it's a lie because they're trying to get out of it. You know, a few days later, a little while later, on down the line. They say, I do, and they really mean, well, maybe. Maybe I don't. It doesn't matter, you know, what type of obligation it is. That's kind of the concept. Well, God God comes in very strongly here in the book of Hosea. Now, let's notice on over in Revelation. Let's notice a little more what God has to say about this type of conduct. We saw in Genesis that when God introduces sin in the Bible, he introduces it under the context of life. 
The first sin that God mentions in the Bible is lying. You realize that's what God closes with? He starts off, and when he introduces the subject of sin, he introduces lying. When he closes the Bible in the book of Revelation, he closes with lying. Notice here in Revelation 21.7, He that overcomes shall inherit all things, I will be his God, he shall be my son. But the fearful, unbelieving, and the abominable, and the murderers, and whoremongers, all sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, last category mentioned, shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, the first thing that God mentions is lying. The last thing that he mentions is lying. In fact, if you come on over and just notice the last three verses of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 18. For I testify unto every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. That's lying, isn't it? If you add something to it that's not there and you just kind of add it in, oh, that's, that's lying, that's deceit. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophet, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. God says, look, you add to, you take away from, you, you, you add in things that aren't there, you take away things that are there, you change the story, you misrepresent what it says. That's why, that's deceit. I think it's rather interesting. God focuses in on it to begin with and focuses in on it to end up with. Because every other sin is, is based on that. Sin, all other sin was an outgrowth of lying. Lying, deceit. The way you entice people to do things they shouldn't do. Look. Lying, deceit. The way you entice people to do things they shouldn't do. Well, come on over, try it. You'll like it. No, they won't. You know, not in the long run. Oh, maybe the pleasures of sin for a season. But in the long run, it's going to hurt. You know, the wages of sin is death. That's truth in advertising. You know, Satan doesn't believe in truth in advertising. He doesn't advertise the wages of sin is death. He says, oh, no, you won't surely die. Come on, try it. You know, you'll like it. It's fun. It's enjoyable. This is the way to get a thrill out of life. He doesn't tell you about the hangovers and the headaches and the problems and the sorrows and the heartache and the things that are going to happen. So, we live in a society that doesn't place very much emphasis on truth. People tell the truth to their advantage. They want other people to tell the truth to them. But, we have so much that is based on deceit. Now, you know, that is, that is something that is the very antithesis of God. Because one of the main things that characterizes God is that God is faithful. God is absolutely true and faithful. Notice back in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4. Let's pick it up in verse 3. Because I will publish the name of the Eternal, ascribe you greatness unto our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. God is a God of truth. Now we read back in John 8 that Satan the devil does not abide in the truth. He is a liar and the father of lies. God is a God of truth. Let's notice a little more about the character of God. Back in James chapter 1. Notice here a little bit of God's character. James chapter 1 and verse 17. Beginning verse 16. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of light, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Comes down from God, the Father of light, with whom is no variableness. God does not vary. God does not vacillate. God is not one thing today and something else tomorrow. With whom is no variableness, neither any shadow of turning. 
God, there is not even a shadow of a change with God. We're told Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God tells us back in Malachi. He says, I am the eternal, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. You know, the reason we're able to live, the reason we have what we have, God says he doesn't change. God made a promise. God made a promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. And God has been faithful to his promise, to his covenant, even though the descendants went out of the way, departed from the way. Every good and every perfect gift comes down from above, from God. There's no variableness, no shadow of turning with God. God is absolutely faithful and true. That's why we can read, for instance, in, in Psalm 100, in verse 5, when it describes God. God's word, it says, the eternal, Psalm 100, verse 5, for the eternal is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. God tells the truth. When God says something, it is that way and it continues on. God is faithful. God is faithful. He keeps his covenant. He performs his word. You can go back in Psalm 89. Verse 1, I will sing of the mercies of the eternal forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness shall you establish in the very heaven. I've made a covenant with my chosen. I've sworn unto David my servant. Your seed will I establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. Heaven shall praise your wonders, O eternal. Your faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. For who in the heaven, who in the heaven can be compared with the eternal? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the eternal? Coming on down, it talks about Verse 14, judgment, justice and judgment are the habitation of your throne. Mercy and truth shall go before your faith. Well, God is true. God's word is true. We're told back in John 17, 17, Jesus Christ said, Thy word is true. What God says is true. God does not say one thing and mean something else. God does not make a promise today and break his promise tomorrow. God's promises stand sure. And you know, brethren, and this brings us even to the subject, and I think it is appropriate that we focus on this in the context of Pentecost. Pentecost is coming up shortly. Because what is what is Pentecost? Well, we find that on the very first Pentecost, this is when God made the old covenant with Israel. Now, a covenant is an agreement. God began to make the new covenant with the church, spiritual Israel, in Acts 2. That's when he began to make the new covenant. And that, again, is, a, is an agreement. That is a covenant. A covenant relationship into which we enter. Now, Israel of old entered into a covenant relationship with God. It was a husband-wife relationship. Israel promised to fulfill the role of the wife. They would Obey, they would submit, they would be faithful, they would show, you know, they, they, they would show that, demonstrate that faithfulness, and that obedience to God. God did not break his part of the covenant. We're told that there was a fault with the old covenant. Hebrews 8 says, for finding fault with them. For finding fault with them. He says, this is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel after those days. Not according to the covenant that I made with them when I took them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke. Israel broke the covenant. And yet God continually pleaded with them. You read it there in Jeremiah. Israel went into spiritual whoredom. God continually admonished them. He says, return unto me, for I am married unto you. God proved faithful. Israel proved unfaithful. God then is making. Jesus Christ came and died. And is today making the new covenant with spiritual Israel. And the whole basis of the covenant 
The whole basis of any covenant relationship is a relationship of faith and trust. And telling the truth is the basis of faith and trust. You can't have faith and trust when someone doesn't tell the truth. We are able to trust God. To rely on the promises of God. To, re- to believe that God will do what he says he will do. Because God abides in the truth. His word is truth. And brethren, we're called. We're called to become partakers of the divine nature. Isn't that what we're told back in Peter? Now, we have been of old partakers of another nature. The nature described in Ephesians 2 of that wicked spirit that works in the children of disobedience. And there was a time when all of us were the children of disobedience. And we were the partakers of another nature, a deceitful nature. The nature of one who is described as a liar and the father of a lie. Who abode not in the truth. Recall be renewed in the spirit of our mind, to put off the old man, to be transformed by a renewing of our mind. We went into some of that last time. That involves putting away a lie. One of the first things that's mentioned there in Ephesians, you know, we put away. When we put on the new man, we have to put away a lie. You see, if you're going to misrepresent the truth, if your word does not mean anything, then you don't begin to have the nature of God because that's one of the things that describes God. That characterizes God. That's that's the way God is. Notice, notice over in Titus 1. Understand a little more fully, and understand more fully the the significance of the fact that God is true. God, God is truthful to us. Titus 1, let's pick it up in verse 1. Paul, the servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, According to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. But has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. In hope of eternal life that God who cannot lie promised before the world began. How do you know you're going to have eternal life? How do you know that you can inherit the kingdom of God? Because God, that cannot lie, has made a promise. How do you know you can rely on the promises of God? How do you know God will do what he says he will do? God doesn't lie. God can't lie. Notice on over in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, let's pick it up in verse 11. In whom, in Christ, also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. This is here, again, what is Pentecost? Pictures the time of the first fruit when God is calling out a first fruit to enter into a covenant relationship with him. All right, that's what we're talking about. We've obtained an inheritance. We're an heir. We are predetermined according to God's purpose. And to be predestined, to be predetermined, has nothing to do with being saved or lost. It has to do with the timing of your calling. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God does things in proper time. We have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own wisdom. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. God has given us the Holy Spirit of promise by which we are sealed. That is the earnest of our inheritance. That means God is going to do what he says he's going to do. God is true. God is faithful. God will back up his word. 
Well, God is not true. God is not faithful. You have no basis to say. Pentecost comes as we are turned to a recognition, to focusing on the covenant relationship, which is actually a marriage covenant between the church and Christ, which physical marriage is a type. We're focused on faithfulness, on the importance of being true. We learn here God has given us the earnest of our inheritance. God, God's not going to change his mind. You know, we're given another promise back in, in Philippians. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. God said, we saw in Ephesians 1 that, that God, that, that God has given us the Holy Spirit of promise, the earnest of our inheritance. Philippians 1 6, we're told, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God who has begun a good work in you will finish what he has started. Now, the only way you can, you know, you can, you can be guaranteed of that. God is faithful. God will do what he has started out to do. God has made a covenant and God does not intend to change his mind. But God's faithful. God does what he says he will do. But not only is God faithful. You know something, brethren? God expects us to be faithful. God absolutely does. He, he tells us, he warns us. And, uh, he warns us in various, he warns us in various places. Uh, for instance, back in, uh, uh back in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 12. Verse 34. O generation of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now we saw before that, that the heart is deceitful above all things, so the heart has to be changed, doesn't it? A good man out of the good treasure of the heart brings forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle man, every idle word, that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Now, an idle word is a word you say that you don't carry through with. It becomes idle. It comes to no good purpose. You say something, you agree to something, you obligate yourself to something, you say yes when you mean maybe, when you mean no, when you just, you know, any old thing will do. Every idle word. God says he's, we're, we're accountable for what we say. God does not account it as a light thing. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. We're held responsible for what we say. Now let's notice on back in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1. Keep your foot when you go to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. Now, you know what the sacrifice of fools is? It's a lot of idle words. That's the sacrifice of fools. Blabbing your mouth. A lot of idle words. I'm going to show you that as we go on down. God says, look, keep your foot. Be careful. Watch your step. That's what he's saying. Watch your step when you come before God. And spend more time listening than talking. You know, God has something more important to say to us than we have to him. Just be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with your mouth. Don't be hasty. Don't just jump into something. Let it pop, let anything pop out. Be not rash with your mouth. Let not your heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven and you are upon the earth. Therefore, let your words be few. You know, be careful. God's in heaven and you're on the earth. And you need to pay attention to what you say. You need to be careful about it. You need to regard it. For a dream comes through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. When you vow a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay that which you have vowed. Better it is that you should not vow 
than that you should bow and not pay. Suffer not, allow not your mouth to cause your flesh to sin. Neither say you before the angel, before the messenger of God, that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hand? Now let's consider a little bit of what's being said here. When you vow a, a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. God expects you to follow through. Now a vow is a solemn covenant, a solemn agreement with God. You know, I think that most of us in this room, or most of us who are adults in this room, have probably made two vows in our life. Some maybe have made more, and maybe some of your vows were vows you shouldn't take. I can think of two right off that uh, I feel that I've taken. One is uh, the most important decision, the most important covenant, the most important agreement or vow that you can make is, is what you take at baptism. You're entering into, you, you're making a vow before God, a solemn covenant, a solemn agreement. You're asked, you know, in a, in a, in a formal sense, uh, as you prepare to be baptized. You know, have you repented of your sin? Have you really surrendered yourself? Have you really turned your life over to God and you're with it? You surrendered yourself. Have you turned your back on the old way? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, as your Lord, as your Master, as your ruler? You say, yes, I have. Well, we, prior to that time, the presence of God is invoked, and you are making a promise, a covenant, a vow before God. A very solemn thing. God's going to hold you accountable for that. You know, when you get married, I know in the ceremony, you know, it's commonly referred to as wedding vows. Where you talk about someone being married, that they're going to exchange vows. That's actually what they're doing, you know. I, I know any time I marry someone, I the, the, this, the format that we use in the service, marriage ceremony of the church, we'll ask the question of one individual, do you, you know, do you solemn, do, do you promise and covenant with God in the presence of these witnesses, to take, you know, so-and-so to be your your wife, to, to go through and enumerate the obligation. You know, do you promise and covenant before God to do this? I do. You're vowing a vow before God. God says, look, when you vow a vow be unto God, defer not to pay it. He has no pleasure in fool. Pay that which you vow. Better it is that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Don't allow your mouth to cause your flesh to sin. You know, don't obligate yourself to something that you don't mean to do because God will hold you responsible. Don't pay. Now, you don't, don't come up with an excuse, you know, before God's messenger that it, it was an error. You know, I, I didn't mean it. I, I, I was just kidding when I said it. I, it was an error. I didn't realize, you know, some of what was involved in that. It, it was an error. Wherefore, should God be angry at your voice? You know, God's not going to be satisfied with that. No, you know, you pay what you vow. It was an error. God says, wherefore, should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hand? God says it's not a light thing. It's a very serious matter. We come before God. We obligate ourselves. We come before God at the Pentecost season. We focus on God, on the faithfulness of God's word, on the faithfulness of God's covenant. We realize that God is faithful, he promised. God is not looking for an excuse to get out of what he's obligated himself to do. Some of us don't want to go back, and we don't want to examine what God says we're under obligation to do, and do it, simply because God says that's what we're obligated to. Oh, no, we have an excuse. Well, yeah, but I don't think it applies to me, because, you see, uh, you know, so-and-so happened, or this happened, or, well, you know, he did this, or she did that, or, or, or well, I, you know, they didn't do it the way I thought they ought to do it, and so I, I'm going to do this. God sets us an example, and God gives us commands, and God tells us. We're going to be judged by every idle word. We're held accountable for what we say. Don't be rash with your mouth. Don't be hasty. Don't, don't say something that you don't mean. Be 
because you are accountable for what you say. Let's notice back in Psalm 15. Psalm 15, verse 1. Eternal, who shall abide in your tabernacle? Who shall dwell in your holy hill? Who's going to be in the kingdom of God? Who's going to be in the new Jerusalem dwelling on Mount Zion? Who's going to be there? He that walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He means what he says and says what he means. You have to have the character of God described in it. The deceitful heart has to be gotten rid of, and a truthful heart has to replace it. He will create in us a clean spirit. Isn't that what we sang in the psalm, back in the 51st psalm? Create in me a clean heart, O God. Get rid of the deceitful heart. Have a renewing of the mind. That's what conversion is all about. He that speaks the truth in his heart, he that backbites not with his tongue, nor does any evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is condemned, but he honors them that fears the eternal. He that swears to his own hurt and changes not. He that puts not out his money to usury, and that's talking about you know, taking advantage of someone else's distress, they're in trouble, and so you loan them something and, and, and are going to make a profit at their trouble. I'm not talking about putting money in the bank, per se. He puts not out his money to usury, nor takes reward against the innocent. He that does these things shall never be moved. He that swears to his own hurt and changes not. You agree to something? What if it proves inconvenient to do what you say? What do you do? You do it anyway. You don't go back on your word. You give your word to someone. God gives his word. Well, Jesus Christ, you know, said he would be the Savior. He followed through with what he said. He that swears to his own hurt and changes not. You don't change because it's inconvenient to, to, to fulfill your obligation. You don't change because it's it's just, you know, not really convenient to do what you said you'd do. You want to be part of the family of God. You want to be in the kingdom of God. You want to dwell in the New Jerusalem. On the holy hill of Mount Zion. Jesus Christ returns to this earth. And establishes his government. You want to be a part of the family of God. You've got right now to partake of the character of God. To be led by God's spirit into the paths of righteousness. To become transformed and renewed in the spirit of our mind. And brethren, the entire way of God is based on truth. Truth. We mean what we say. We say what we mean. We back up and we fulfill our obligations and our responsibilities. doesn't matter if they're inconvenient. doesn't matter if they're difficult. Very important concept, and I think a concept that has basically been lost in our society. A concept that too many of us in the church have had lesson in our awareness, and we've begun to take our word somewhat lightly. We give our word, we agree to things, and then problems come up. And we simply just don't do what we said we would do. We said we would. We said I do, and then we don't. Brethren, we need to really I think examine ourselves, we need to be more aware of the importance and the significance that God lays in being what we say we are and doing what we say we will do. And allowing God to transform and change and renew us into his own image, becoming a partaker of the divine nature. The nature of the great God who abides in the truth. Whose word is truth from the beginning. Our word also needs to be true. There was a time here in this nation 
particularly in this part of the country, where many times business arrangements were just simply made as a verbal agreement. You know, yes, I'll do this or I'll do that. And they shook hands, and that was it. That, that was all there was. That was the only contract that was needed. They simply talked it over and said, well, yes, I'll do this, you do that, you shook hands, and it was settled. I think we realize that's not generally the way business is conducted today. There would be a lot of lawyers and a lot of courts that would be out of business if it were. One of the most thriving, growing uh, growth industries uh, is, of course, in the legal profession. And the whole civil court do uh, doctrine is primarily composed of individuals who are trying to go back on their word. You know, if you eliminate from the civil court docket in this nation, every case that involved a person who was trying to go back on his word, you'd pretty well eliminate things. I, I don't know. Maybe there would be one or two left, but I think those would be few and far between. Because you see that this involves, uh, this involves everything. It involves divorce. Now, at one time, they gave their word. They said, I do. Now, they've come to a point where they said, well, I don't really. People made an agreement. They signed a contract. Well, you know, you pay me so much, and I'll go in, and I'll, uh, and I'll, uh, uh, you know, do this work on your house, or I'll buy this, and you, you, uh, you know, give me so much. And they make this agreement. And then somewhere along the line, they decide, well, you know, I don't really want to do that. I, I don't think that's a very good deal. I don't think I'm going to follow through with that. There was an interesting article in Houston Post uh, just a couple of days ago. I don't know how many of you saw it. Uh, it, it just, it was tragic, really, and it, and it focused in on the type of things that go on in our society. It gave the story of a man here in Houston. In fact, he's actually employed by a government agency, uh, an agency that has as its job to make loans to low-income people to help them fix up their homes. It's a government-subsidized loan program. This particular man worked for this program. But he was also in a category where he needed some help. And so he applied for a loan uh, under the terms of this program. It took him three months to process his loan. Uh, you know, all the paperwork and everything. And he was mentioning in there, he says, you know, I'm better equipped to handle this stuff than most, most people because I, I work for them. I know how it goes. Knowing the ropes took him three months to get it through. And so they signed a contract. This guy was going to come in. Boy, he was going to fix the house up. And they had uh, stipulated in the contract there was a date. I think it was December 14th, and he's supposed to be completed, have all the work completed. Well, here it is, of course, the end of May, and you guessed it, the work is not nearly completed. In fact, it had a picture of this guy sitting there in his house, and it was all uh, torn to shambles. Uh, this contractor had come in, torn out the plumbing, done a few other odds and ends, and, and then just simply quit. He'd gotten what money he thought he could get out of it, and uh, somewhere along the line, he changed his mind, and he decided that he wasn't really going to follow through. He, uh, his word didn't mean anything. His signature on a piece of paper didn't mean anything. Well, you hear this thing has been haggling on. Instead of December 14th, you know, January, February, March, April, May, all is coming gone. And the job still isn't finished. Contract doesn't mean anything. Word doesn't mean anything. Obligation doesn't mean anything. The old lawyers... Uh, the legal profession has, has multiplied 